truths. It's kind of these eternal truths of build a really good product that has some intrinsic value that people can use and enjoy. And if you do that and you treat people with kindness and respect and integrity, over time, you will build a brand and a company. And, you know, that's how our brand was built. I am unwilling to give up that I will start over from scratch as many times as it takes to get where I want to be. I want to be. We just want to make sure you will get knocked down, but just make sure you don't get knocked out, knocked out. So your only choice should be go focus on what you can control, control, control. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Kara Golden Show. Join me each week for inspiring conversations with some of the world's greatest leaders, We'll talk with founders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and really some of the most interesting people of our time. Can't wait to get started. Let's go. Let's go. Hey, everybody. It's Kara Golden, and I'm here with Robert Passan. Nice to see you. Great to be here, Kara. Good to see you. So Robert is the CEO of a brand that is worldwide, incredible, incredible brand. I think pretty much everyone had one as a child and then some, but Radio Flyer. So I'm so excited. Whenever I say that name, you know, smiles are coming out of my mouth or does that make sense? <laughs> yes, so, it does. You know I mean. We live for you know that. I mean. We live for smiles. I love it. So Robert is the CEO. The business was founded by his grandfather in 1917. So cool. That's just awesome. Iconic brand. Robert is based out of Chicago and just incredible. Works with the team on the mission to create products that bring smiles to kids. I mean, what a mission statement, right? Like it makes total sense. We were just chatting about YPO. We're both part of the YPO network. Shout out to that group, which is Young Presidents Organization. But company sales have grown significantly with Robert's focus on building highly committed and creative teams that really are thinking about new and innovative products, but never really disrupting kind of that core product I see when when I've been in the toy stores over the years, but definitely has expanded, which I think is amazing beyond the little red wagon to include tricycles and scooters and other ride-on toys. Really, really cool. So, And Robert is also an Emmy-winning producer of the animated short film Taking Flight, which is very, very cool. So anyway, welcome, Robert. Very excited to have you here. I'm excited to be here. Very excited. So first of all, tell us a little bit about the history. Your grandfather founded the company. What was sort of the the vision? Yeah, my grandpa came from a poor working class family in northern Italy, and uh, they were carpenters. So his father and grandfather were carpenters. And as a small boy, my grandpa, whose name was Antonio, tagged around with his dad and grandpa, learning all of those essential carpentry skills but they were really poor. So when my grandpa turned 16, he felt like he could find a better life in America. He landed in Chicago and he worked in any job he could find, like any immigrant. So carrying railroad ties, working on construction crews, washing celery. So he was a day laborer and he saved every penny that he made. And after a few years, he was able to save up enough to rent a small garage on the west side of Chicago. And in that garage, He created a workshop and he started making furniture, was the first thing that he made. He also made phonograph cabinets, those old Victrolas that you crank up and play records on. And he also made a wagon, a wooden wagon that he used to haul tools. And pretty soon customers were buying more wagons than anything else. So I I guess today we'd say he pivoted uh, to the business that was working and he, he just went with what was selling well. And he called that first wagon the Liberty Coaster because... The first thing he saw when he came to this country was the Statue of Liberty, and he was so inspired by that. And then one day when he was visiting an equipment supplier, as the wood wagon business was building up over a few years, he was introduced to the metal stamping technology pioneered by the auto industry. And he realized he could apply this new technology to his product to mass produce it and stamp these wagons out of steel instead of making each one out of wood. And this is what resulted in the creation of the iconic Little Red Wagon that we've all come to know and love. And 
because he mass produced wagons, uh, it earned him the nickname Little Ford because he did for wagons what Ford did for, it. for the automotive industry. And and this was also the birth of the brand, Radio Flyer. And everybody always says, you know, why is it named Radio Flyer? And it's because in the late 20s, those were the two highest tech innovations of the day, the radio and the airplane. So they were just two cool buzzwords that my grandpa put on the product. And I like to joke if he were naming it today, it might be something like Quantum AI Dronester. You know, that would be the equivalent of, of what the name means. So there was no branding agency. There was, <laughs> there was a, no branding agency. Right? That's amazing. That's how, I get that question all the time with Hint. People are, and it, there wasn't. It was me just sitting there thinking about it and, you know. I think oftentimes those are the most authentic brands, right? Because and sometimes there's a little bit even of a disconnect with like, why radio flyer on a wagon? It doesn't really make sense. It doesn't have anything to do with the radio. But I think maybe the incongruity of the name with the product is one of the things that's made it stick. I totally agree. That's such an awesome story. And then, so he went on to grow this. Yeah. It sounds like he didn't even know if it was a company. It was like started with a bunch of products, right? Yeah, like he it just was... started. I mean, he was a builder, you know, he just built, he was a carpenter and he was super passionate about design and quality. And he was just a, he had a unique personality. I mean, to do what he did, he only had a third grade education coming here with no money building this business. He was an incredibly generous person. He had this big, huge smile. He was very gregarious, friendly guy. He had really high integrity. I, I mean, I remember being at his funeral many, many years later. He lived a very long life. And all these people came up to me saying, you know, I knew your grandpa. I worked with him for many years or I worked at the company. And he was an amazing guy. He, his word was his bond. I, I met an equipment supplier that he bought lots of equipment from through the years. And he said, you know, I never had a contract with your grandpa. It was always a handshake deal. And I didn't do that wow. with anybody else, but I, cause, cause I could trust him. So he had this amazing blend of qualities. I think that it really what made him so successful. And I think the design, the passion for design, the passion for quality is something that really got baked into the DNA of the company. And it's something we're still super, super passionate about. That's awesome. Now, did your dad go on to mm -hmm. then to take over the company or? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell one story, but my first visit to the company was with my dad. So I was just five years old. And I vividly remember that uh, day because my dad brought me to work with him. And I'd never been to work with my dad. And I remember, you know, holding his big hand and walking into the building and everything seemed so huge. And so awesome. And walking around the factory and, you know, the loud no noises of these punch presses stamping out wagons and the smell of grease and paint and all of these shiny red wagons were going by on, on the conveyor line. And as a little kid, it looked like some sort of magical Rube Goldberg machine that was cranking out these shiny red wagons and sending them into the world. And it just seemed so magical to me. And it really, that was when I fell in love with, with Radio Flyer. And I, I fell in love with that creative process of things being made out of you know steel and paint and rubber making them into these adorable toys. And I started to fall in love with what Radio Flyer meant to people. And as I got older, I worked in the company. I worked there. I worked at the company during the summers. And that's when I started to fall in love with I, what I thought the potential of what Radio Flyer could become. That's super interesting. So where was the first place he actually, I mean, I guess he sold them literally to kind of friends and people he would meet on the street. Was there like, what was his retail strategy? Yeah, the retail strategy was that all of our wagons are assembled by the consumers to, from the moment my grandpa built them to today. So this is the Ikea, the Ikea <laughs> furniture yeah. style. Of a, and so he built this first prototype this wooden wagon and he would disassemble it put it into this big old leather battered suitcase and he'd walk down the street to a hardware store a local hardware store and he'd go in there and he barely spoke any english and you know he would smile a lot <laughs> use a lot of body language because he didn't have a lot of language and he would start putting this wagon together and he got a lot of doors shut in his face. He got a lot of reaction. He got a lot of ridicule for not being able to speak English and being an immigrant. And But he just kept going. And, you know, he found that one hardware store owner. It's like, sure, you know, I'll buy one. And then he sold him another one and another one. And it was very, very slow going for many, many years. It took years for him to build up the business that way. 
I think it's fascinating. That's what I thought you were going to say, because I I bet like it was actually somewhat brilliant, right? Because you had a customer that was coming into the hardware store and, you know, trying to keep your kids busy, right? And, you know, and he didn't intend that to, I'm sure he didn't sit there and think, oh, I'm going to go and, you know, sell in all these hardware stores. But I mean, that was probably, I would say that was probably the first place that I used to actually see it. And then, Mm -hmm. of course, there was probably a, now you call it a pull strategy, right? And (laughs) and toy stores were probably, you know, FAO was probably then coming to him, you know, years or your dad or whatever years later and saying, maybe we need this because we're seeing, you know, it's it's an interesting case study, I'm sure, on him sort of, he's an accidental, I, I have a book coming out in a few weeks and one of my chapters talks about you know, me be an accidental entrepreneur. I didn't really like sit there and say, I want to be an entrepreneur one day. Although my dad was sort of a frustrated entrepreneur living inside of a large company. He worked for a company called ConAgra and he developed a brand called Healthy Choice. And so I was sure. the I was the product of, you know, living in this house where my dad's always tinkering and thinking of ideas and, you know, them not wanting to sort of do his ideas. But Healthy Choice, you know, is still such a iconic brand, you know, that he created. But what I learned, you know, about entrepreneurism and about large companies and about, you know, pull strategies and all all this and slotting fees and things like that, that I do clearly learned from him, but I still never kind of connected the dots. I spent years in, in tech prior to deciding to be a beverage executive. And even still, I don't consider myself a beverage executive. I, I'm really <laughs> about, you know, health and about, you know, like I believe that everybody should have the right to drink clean water and everybody should, you know, be able to drink things that actually help them get healthier if that's what they choose versus getting tricked. And so, you know, those are the things that I think about and why and the Hint product helped the vision come true. And I feel like when I hear your story, that's what I start thinking about as well, that he may not have been able to articulate it, but what he was doing around helping people smile, helping people, you know, keep their kids busy, like he was doing it. He just didn't know he was doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he he had a very simple philosophy. And I think it's one of the reasons why it, it's endured for so long, because it's kind of these eternal truths of build a really good product that has some intrinsic value that people can use and enjoy. And if you do that, and you treat people with kindness and respect and integrity, over time, you will build a brand and a company. And, and you know, that's how our brand was built. I mean, it was not through any, we never did any advertising. It was all word of mouth but from consumers telling each other, hey, I love this product and them going and buying one and doing that year after year for so many years. If you can build a brand like that, it's, it's really, really powerful. So how do you feel as a you know, obviously you've done an amazing job of leading this company, but what are the pressures of like running a family business and, you know, taking over an iconic brand like that? Like if you mess it up, right? Like what, you know, (laughs) that'd be really bad. We'd all be really mad at you, Robert, for, you know, doing that. Like what, like, do you you think about that? I mean, I, I feel like, you know, my kids, people always say, are your kids going to take over the business? I'm like, I don't don't know. I don't think so. I don't really think about it right now, but they might, I don't know. You never know. Yeah. Well, what comes to mind when you ask me that question is my first real day on the job when I was uh, 23 years old in 1992. And, you know, so I told this story about being a little kid coming in with my dad and now, you know, fast forwarding to 1992, I went into my dad's office and and basically not much had changed since the Eisenhower administration. You know, it was the same paint, same furniture, same drapes. Uh, there was even a clock on my dad's desk that was stopped. And oh my it, just, God. it felt like everything <laughs> was frozen in time, you know. And and then I realized that the bank was there saying, you know, you guys have no cash, you have no cash. And the fact was, we were in financial trouble. And, you know, any company that's been around for as long as, as we have will have ups and downs. And we were clearly in a down period. And then shortly after that first day, competitors came out with plastic wagons. And so like fuel was just poured on the fire and we were in complete crisis. So that's how I started my you know real career at Radio Flyer. And in many ways, you know, that was an incredible gift because I was just thrown into this crucible of we have to figure out what we're doing. And the external environment had changed. 
consumer preferences had changed for our product. So these plastic wagons offered a lot of features that moms especially really liked. Like you could mold in cup holders, you could have high back seats. So the kids were contained in the wagon versus a steel wagon. And we weren't talking to consumers. We weren't doing market research. We were basically an inwardly focused manufacturer that had worked great for 70 years, but it wasn't working anymore. And so it became, it was really clear to me why we had existed. And that was to to make wagons, make steel wagons. Yeah. But it wasn't really clear why we should continue to exist or even if we needed to continue to exist. So we entered into this process of asking a lot of questions, focusing on the brand and saying, well, what does Radio Flyer mean to people? I mean, you started this whole conversation by saying smiles. And you know that seems very obvious, but it was something that we uncovered in this process because we didn't mm-hmm. think of ourselves in the company that way. We thought of ourselves as a steel manufacturer. Yeah. And so we unlocked all these really great themes of like kids playing outside, you know, wind in your hair, sun in your face. And being with people you loved. And so we started to articulate that we went from, you know, we make wagons to we we bring smiles and create warm memories that last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that became our mission. And it unlocked all this potential for more new products and growth. And that was really when we started to reinvent the company. So interesting. And so your father was there at the time when you came in? Yeah, my father was leading the company. And, you know, my dad was an incredible mentor to me because he allowed me to do so much at such a young age. And he he allowed me to make a lot of mistakes, you know, get my hands dirty and learn a lot and was incredibly supportive and stuff I never would have been able to do somewhere else, you know, because it was our family business. And because my dad was a CEO, I mean, he loosened the reins a lot so that I could learn. And I, I just learned like I was a sponge. And I, my whole goal was I'm a student here. I want to learn as much as possible. And it was amazing. That's super, super cool. And so, and you've got four kids. Are any of them working in the business? None are working in the business. And, you know, my approach on that is that uh, I always say to my kids, all of you are welcome to come into the business. There's some criteria. Uh, The criteria is you have to really be interested in the business and then you have to be well suited to the business because it's not for everybody. And the family business cannot be a default. Like, I can't. You know, I dropped out of college, so I'm going into the family business, or I can't get another job, and I'm going into the family business. That's not how it works here. And it's completely fine if you don't come into the business and do your own thing. So so that's kind of been my approach. And really, that was how my dad treated it with me, too. And I think that's one of the reasons why I didn't feel this obligation to go into the business. And and you mentioned earlier, like, do, are you worried about, like, what if you screw it up? And it's not so much that, but it is highly motivating to me that I feel like this was just an incredible gift. I mean, I lucked yeah. out. I was born yeah. to the guy who's <laughs> you know, the grand. I have a grandpa who started the company. That's total luck. I'm incredibly grateful for it. And it really motivates me to take this gift and turn it into something amazing. Yeah. But also you, you know, describe it very passionately about what, you know, what your grandfather went through, right. In order Mm -hmm. to build this too. And I think like that is, that's something that as a CEO, I think my kids, you know, see this even building hint, you know, over the last 15 years, I mean, they will be able to describe that and they describe it today. Like they're like, oh, you know, I listen to your mom's podcast and my kids are, you know, somewhat horrified (laughs) by the whole thing, right? But then they're also like, oh yeah, she works really hard. Like she's like, you know, she's off doing this. She's off doing this. I think that's an incredible gift to your kids when people, when they can see that, because they don't see, they don't get the, the miss, they see the full true story. I think they see the really good stuff the wins, the the thrills of, of having success in a business, but they see the tough stuff too and the, the challenges and the the time that has to be put in. And so I think it's a very realistic view when you when you can see one of your parents working like that. Yeah, no, I think it's it's really powerful. And I have a story in my book about getting kicked out of Starbucks and my son was one of his friends told him another horrifying that that uh, oh I was I ordered your mom's book and there he's like oh my god <laughs> and, so, and so apparently he heard me talking in an interview about the Starbucks story about getting kicked out and there and you know I talk in the story I talk about what happened next which was actually like a really good thing and so I talk about the journey and sometimes these bad things happen you know you talked about in 1992 when that situation happened and 
you know, you have lows, but I always say like the lows can't last, right? Like you have to look at what else can you do? And so, you know, for us, we had all this inventory that we were stuck with. We were trying to figure out what what to do. And then I got a phone call from Amazon and they were launching this Amazon grocery business. And I didn't know if it was going to work or not, but I was like, I have all this inventory. I'll send a truck today. And I didn't tell him, you know, that he said, I buy it at Amazon. All the, I mean, at inside Starbucks all the time. And I didn't know if I should tell him, but he wasn't asking. So I wasn't going to tell him we just got kicked out of Starbucks. And so, you know, I just told him I had the inventory. So anyway, my son, he said, Oh, yeah, I guess you're your mom was saying like they got kicked out of Starbucks and she told this whole story of how like, you know, devastating it was for them when, you know, they had 40% of their business and overall business in that retailer. And I remember talking about it in YPO and just being like, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do and went through all these lessons and et cetera. But, you know, the key thing that I feel like I I got out of that conversation too, was that my son said to me, I remember when you were going through that. And that was just like a, that was a really like, you couldn't sort of hide your feelings. Like Mm -hmm. how like, you know, one minute you were like pissed and blaming someone else. And then the next minute you were saying, I never should have had 40% of my business sitting in someone else's hands. And sure, you've had situations like that as well, where it's just like, you don't know who to be mad at, you know, and you own it eventually yourself, but you're like, I'm never going to make that mistake again. And, you know, and also realize that Howard Schultz was just trying to run his own business, right? And make the right decisions for him and that his decisions were not like in my favor, right? Mm -hmm. And it sucked, but it was like, so anyway, but it's interesting because he actually has his own perspectives and now he's, you know, in college and he said he was like in a class where he was talking about kind of that experience. And so you just never know what people pick up on and you as, you know, the recipient of your father and your, and your grandfather. Anyway, I just think yeah. it's... Well, I think it's kind of that old Winston Churchill qu- quote, never let a good crisis go to waste. And if, if you can learn at a young 100%. age that sometimes these crises are incredible opportunities to either retool your business or learn something new or take it to a whole new level. Yeah, no, I think that's that's so critical. So, you know, we're recording this, obviously, hopefully ending COVID. I, I, maybe I'm too optimistic, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm, why not? I'm going with it. But in all seriousness, I mean, how has the last few months been for you guys as a brand? Well, I mean, the first impact to us was in March. I mean, we went from 100% work in office to almost 100% work from home within one week. So we had never had a distributed workforce like that. And and so much of our work is so highly collaborative, like product development and designing products. And so it was a huge, huge change for us. And our team did an amazing job. Everyone got really up to speed. And we had to adapt a lot of the ways that we do things. Like, for example, when we're developing a new product, you know, we have a prototype shop here in our building that can make anything. We have 3D printers and CNC machines and welders. And and so usually the process is, you know, the the designer sketches something. We do, we mock up a quick prototype. We all look at it together. We make changes and we just keep iterating day after day on the product. So we had to come up with new ways to do that. And uh, we were able to have our two prototype people here doing that stuff. But then we would either, you know, that prototype would have to be dropped off, you know, in somebody's front yard. And (laughs) it was uh, like all these exchanges and handoffs. And and our team, you know, got uh, started doing some brainstorming. We do all these brainstormings in a room with post-its, traditional brainstorming. We went to using a Miro software where people can brainstorm together online. And so the team's done an amazing job, and actually, we haven't really missed a beat once we got it, once we got up to speed. We were really worried at the beginning about sales because of the economic impact of this pandemic, and but we were surprised to find that because families couldn't go to the zoo or couldn't go to the amusement park or couldn't go on vacation, they started buying more of our products. So instead of going on a vacation or, you know, going away for the weekend, you know, we've got kids riding tricycles and scooters around the block as a mini vacation. And so that has been really, really, I think, gratifying for the team because we always get lots of stories and photos from families and with adorable kids on our products. And we love that. But now more than ever, you know, we have heard back from our customers, like 
radio flyers are a bright spot in our lives. You know, when our kids are bouncing off the walls, it. they can go out and, and ride on a product. And one of our newest products that we launched last year is a, it's an electric go-kart that has three speeds. It goes pretty fast. It's for kids three to eight. And that thing has just been selling like crazy because it's so fun. You can spin out in the cul-de-sac. You can ride it all the time. And so that has helped make the other challenges a lot easier because we've been playing that role in people's lives and families' lives. And direct to consumer, where do you see that? Yeah, we sell yeah, we sell on radioflyer.com. We have a really robust website. The things that we sell the most of on radioflyer.com are products you can't get anywhere else. Um, you can't get them at our other retailers because they're customizable. So we have our own version of Nike ID where you can customize a wagon. You can put your kid's name on it, you can put your family's name on it. <laughs> I have some <laughs> child gifts that yes. I need to buy. I'm headed there right after yes, this. We Robert. even have a Tesla. You can awesome. we have a partnership with Tesla. So we do the Tesla kids car, the electric kids car. And you buy it just like a Tesla, but at radiofire.com. So you pick the color, you pick the oh color of your Tesla. You can pick the battery size. You can put your kid's name on the license plate. How long does it take to get a Tesla? Well, about a week. I should really tick my friends off and tell them that I've like I I got like <laughs> I'm getting my Tesla in a week, right? Aren't they are Right. That'll make everybody like, I got to look this up to just really annoy some people who've been waiting for their Tesla. I'll tell them like I skipped the line and I got my Tesla. Right. Exactly. That's hysterical. That's so funny. I love it. I'm definitely going to go there. That's such a good idea. So, but you've definitely seen an increase in e-commerce. Yes. Yeah, yeah we have. Right. Yeah. And, that's and awesome. at all of our customers at, at Walmart, Amazon, and Target, all of the online retailers have had big increases. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I I feel like you guys are, I mean, one thing that I think many people are waking up to around the Hint brand is that we're really an omni-channel brand where we, yes, we are in retailers like the ones that you mentioned, but we're also, we're in Amazon and we also have our direct-to-consumer business. Our business grew, our online business grew from 40 to 55% of our overall business since March. So it's, it's pretty nutty. And you know, it's a lot for a beverage. I'm I'm surprised. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing that I think we sort of have played. I mean, I came from that background. I was at AOL for seven years and I never really even thought that that business was kind of doable in grocery. And I always talk about Amazon in my mind was really the one that kind of opened it up to you know, possibilities and kind of it was game changing for the grocery industry. But the challenge with Amazon, as you know, is that, you know, you you don't really have a relationship with the customer. So you're not getting the emails, you're not. And so at the beginning of March, when, you know, we were out of stock, people were hoarding in grocery stores, the shelves were not getting replenished as quickly. We were doing our best to sort of help and support the retailers and we're an essential product, which definitely helped. We were in a better position than other people. We reached out to our customer base, which was, you know, well over a million people. And we just said, hey, like, if you want to stay inside and you should, and you don't need to go to stores or, you know, or you don't feel safe to go to stores, like, you can definitely go to drinkhint.com and order. And I mean, we had a crazy response, like 60% of our base like ordered from this email. It was was insane. And so it really spoke to kind of, you know, that relationship that we have with the consumer and kind of guiding them, but also, you know, a different product than Radio Flyer and that, you know, for, I feel like the one thing that has really, really been highlighted for me as a leader in 2020 is the importance of health. And mm-hmm. I've been talking about that for the last 15 years and I've waited for the consumer. I've always said like, it doesn't matter, you know, your gender, how much money you have, where you live, like it's all, you know, doesn't matter. If you don't have your health, you have nothing, yeah. right? Like I've talked to so many people about this and it just stops you in your tracks. And so I think this is, this pandemic has, you know, created an awareness like I've never seen since I've been alive around that topic yeah. for everyone. And and I think people are trying to stay healthy and, you know, and, and they feel like they've got to do whatever they can in order to stay healthy. And I think just what you actually put in your body is like the first step for so many mm-hmm. where, you know, and exercising and 
you know, all of that. So anyway, my grandpa always used to say, he'd always say, you only get one of these and he'd point to his body. (laughs) You only get one of these. (laughs) So take care of it. It's true, right? I would have loved your grandfather. I love hearing stories like that. It's super great. So uh, just a couple other quick questions. So best advice you've ever received? I think feedback is a gift. Feedback is a gift. I like that a lot. So I always, and I, you seem like you're this type of person. I always say that we should always be learning, right? Even as leaders, that it's so important. And I always encourage my teams to, to hire people that are better than them, smarter than them, know stuff that they don't, because I said it's for you, like selfishly, because you're going to keep learning when you hire people that are not just you know, working underneath you and doing that stuff that you don't want to do, or you know how to do it. Sounds like you have the same kind of the same theory. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in terms of culture, another one of my favorite quotes is the Peter Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, you know, I think the what culture means to me is that it's it's your habit. It's the how you do things on a team or a company. And, you know, everybody talks a lot about goals and goals are really important. But when you think about it, pretty much everybody's got the same goals. You know, in business, your goal is to grow your sales and to satisfy customers. On a sports team, your goal is to win and have championships. So everybody's kind of got the same goals. The thing that makes the difference is your habits. It's how you do it. Mm -hmm. And the accumulation of your daily habits as a team is what makes a culture. And so that's, we spend a lot of time on our culture and we've, we've gotten a lot of recognition of our team, you know, best places to work lists. And I think it's because we spend so much time on it. I love that. So I always ask this last question, what makes you unstoppable? I think just not stopping. Is that, is that like answering the question in a circular yeah. uh, method? I think not getting complacent. Like, um, and I think really understanding that you can be stopped. You can lose your business. You know, I think having those early experiences that I had where we were close to the brink taught me that, you know, you can lose something. And so, and it can, you can lose stuff pretty quick. So it's like your health, that metaphor of, you know, it takes a long time to get in shape and get healthy. And it's really important to maintain it because you can, backslide really fast. Yeah, no, I love it. And how do people reach you, Robert? And obviously radioflyer.com, but also you and are you on social? Yeah, LinkedIn would be the probably the best way to get me. Uh, and all my contact information is on LinkedIn. I love it. I love it. Well, this was so awesome. Thank you. And on so many fronts. I I loved it. You guys definitely, if you're listening and and definitely put high marks for (laughs) Robert on on the the podcast and and definitely subscribe. Uh, We're now doing these recordings twice a week on Mondays and Wednesdays. And we're super excited to get your feedback as well. Or if you guys know any people that we should have on here. We would love to hear from you. So thanks so much and have a great rest of the week. Before we sign off, I want to talk to you about fear. People like to talk about fearless leaders, but achieving big goals isn't about fearlessness. Successful leaders recognize their fears and decide to deal with them head on in order to move forward. This is where my new book, Undaunted, comes in. This book is designed for anyone who wants to succeed in the face of fear, overcome doubts, and live a little undaunted. Order your copy today at undauntedthebook.com and learn how to look your doubts and doubters in the eye and achieve your dreams. For a limited time, you'll also receive a free case of Hint Water. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to spotlight? Send me a tweet at Kara Golden and let me know. And if you like what you heard, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Golden. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.